uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, on behalf of the Medardis, I would like to welcome you to a webinar Wednesday, and thank you very much for joining tonight's session. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Uh, a very warm welcome to Professor Rohit Arora from Innsbruck in Austria and to Dr. Lukas Walschott from Nessel in Belgium, who will uh, discuss the indications and the usage of FPL and hook plates on the distal radius. Just one comment uh, from my side before we start. And to ensure the best streaming quality, I would like to ask you to keep your microphones on mute and your cameras switched off. And please feel free to ask questions anytime in the chat box, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. And we will um, read out the, uh, the questions at the end of each presentation. And for your information, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on the MedArtist YouTube channel over the next couple of days. So again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Rohit. Welcome, everybody. I will, Welcome yeah. to this uh, webinar. Today, it's our pleasure to talk about the FPL plate and the hook plate. And uh, I remember when we started to do a surgery on the distal radius fracture, we started in our, about the 80s. Professor Pechlaner was, was the first who invented his own plate. It was the low profile plate with Leibinger. When we started to do surgeries on the distal radius, I cannot remember that we had uh, problems with the, with the flexor tendons. And then suddenly it was a new problem for us creating when we use the, the locking plates. As you see here, this is the flexopolysis longus tendon. It was uh, ruptured. You see here and downstairs in the down uh, picture photograph that uh, the plate is uh, still there. And the problem is you cannot suture them end to end. And that means you need some kind of tendon grafting. And you can uh, imagine the patient comes here to you with a distal radius fracture and the fracture is maybe united. And then you have to do surgery and he's out of work for more than six months, which is not a, which is a social economic big problem. But uh, what is the problem here is you have a very distal radius fracture. You can imagine that you need to overcome this fracture line and uh, you can only overcome this if you put a plate distal to the watershed line. And this was the first generation of the synthesis plates. We had the 90 degrees <clears throat> locking screws and we could not address these kind of fractures in another proper way. But you know that the distal to the watershed line that you might have some problems with the flexor tendons. On the right photograph, you see the flexor tendons and don't, don't forget that the, this, the watershed line is uh, distally to the pronator quadratus muscle. So that's the big problem. And especially in uh, extension of the wrist, you might have problem. And that's the video we said, we show that on the upper side, you see that the flexor tendon has direct contact with the plate. And here the plate is much proximal and proximal to the watershed line and you have no contact. But what if the, pro the thing is what, what to do if the fracture is distally to the watershed line? And there's a very nice uh, paper from Sung, and he said even on the x-ray, you can pretend the problems of the flexor tendon. And this, uh, in Sung grade two, you have an association of flexor tendon problems more than 80, 85%. And you can imagine, actually, we don't want to see a plate placed over this, the volar rim of the distal radius, and this will always cause some problem. And what about this fracture? It looks like a simple fracture, but it's actually not because the volar part, the volar lunate facet fragment is totally separated from the, the dorsal uh, fragment. And of course, if you want to fix this fracture, <clears throat> you have to use any plate which is overcoming the watershed line. And this is the volar rim plate from Synthes, which we only used twice. And in both of the cases, we had some problems. Even if we removed the plate, we had some problems with the flexor tendon. Everyone is talking about the watershed line, and then you are using a, a plate 
which is directly violating the watershed line. So this is a very distally placed pl uh, plate. You have to put the screws proximally directed, just not to uh, penetrate the joint. And this was the patient. And uh, even if we went back to remove the plate, we already had some problems, tenosynovitis of the plexopolysis longus tendon. So that's why we only used the plate twice and never uh, used it again, because uh, we had to search for other problems. And the problem with the flexor tendon is that they don't have some uh, pain receptors. You just uh, feel the, uh, the infunction. They don't come back and say they have pain. And we had some ruptures as early as three months and even after 10 years, and here the question arises, what about plate, in, plate removal? Do we have to remove the plates? Even after 10 years, we can have some flexor tendon ruptures. And that's the question. And what we do is we do the ultrasound. And if we see any friction of the tendon with the plate, so we always uh, uh, tell the patients that we suggest to remove the plates. But even if you have a zoom grade one or two, we always suggest them to remove the plate as early as the bone has united. So I would then another post in <clears throat> problem is even if you have a, this kind of fracture and you use this, uh, this uh, new generation of plate, which is actually meant to put proximal to the watershed line, you still have a problem. And in this case, it's not only the flexopolysis longus tendon, but also the index rup uh, tendon ruptured. And the question is, if you do a CT scan, this is the same patient, you see that the plate is not on the bone. And sometimes the people come and say, okay, this is a problem of the plate. So this is a Zoom grade two. But for me, this is not a plate problem and also not the problem of the plate position. This is the problem of under reduction. You see here, we have an anatomically uh, shaped plate, V and V. As a hand surgeon, we do the reduction on the volar cortex. We, we believe that, okay, we have a nice reduction because the volar cortex is very nicely reduced, but we just miss that the volar lunate facet fragment is tilted proximally because we don't see, we don't want to open the joint from the volar side. And that's why we have a tilt over there. And this is, you see that the plate is not on the bone, but the problem is not because of the plate. And uh, we call it uh, the so-called V-shaped deformity, it's a V. And uh, Professor Lutz, he said that, that um, this is the teardrop angle from Medoff. And uh, my, my senior Lutz, he said that even if you have this V-shaped deformity, it's not about the problem of the, of the uh, palmar lunate facet but also that the radiocarpal force distribution is more. He did a biomechanical study, and he also could show that the radiocarpal range of motion is uh, decreased because the lunate is caught in the lunate facet because of the deepened uh, lunate facet fragment. And this is also a pre uh, arthritic factor for the radiocarpal arthritis. So actually we don't want to have this V-shaped deformity and especially in fractures, we call them centrally fractured dislocation. It's like a blowout fracture where the volar fragment is totally separated from the dorsal fragment. In this case, we have big problems to reduce them. So then the question came, why not to use the FPL plate? FPL plate is made just to avoid uh, tendon problems, especially for the flexopolysis longus tendon. And uh, we know that the diameter of the tendon in, at, at this level is about 4.9. And we had to know what is the corridor for the flexor tendon. So we did some studies and we know that the FPL tendon is lying from the distal tubercle of the scaphoid and then to the scaphoid joint. So this is the corridor, anatomically corridor, where the FPL tendon is lying in every distal radius fracture in the wrist, actually. So if you want to put the FPL plate, and if you want to use the FPL plate with this radial and intermediate and ulnar column, we have to put the plate in this corridor. Otherwise, it makes no sense. And we did our study, and we saw that in 52%, the FPL was lying in the corridor. And the, sorry, the plate was lying in the corridor in this V-shaped 
uh, plates, so we had no flex of paralysis, longus tendon, synovitis, and also no problem. But in 36 or 37 percent, the FPL was not in the in the center of the corridor. So this is uh, the problem which we have having even using the FPL plate. So we saw that only uh, we had a position of the of the flexor tendon also very very out of the V shape of the plate. So this is actually the problem. And in this study from Schlickung in 2018, he showed that if, when you are using your wrist and in, especially in a, a ulnar deviation, the FPL tendon moves. And even if you make a fist, only making a fist moves the FPL tendon to, to ulnar words. And then the FPL tendon is uh, actually hitting the, uh, the ulnar uh, plate uh, corner. And this of course uh, can cause you some problems. So the, the other problem is the radius width. Not everybody is same. Everybody has a different radius. And if you see on the left X-ray, so this, this uh, plate is too much on the, on the radial side because the corridor is not good for the FPL tendon. The same is, problem is also in the second uh, X-ray. You see that uh, the width is uh, too small for this plate, and especially on the third and fourth. You can imagine, as I told you, the flexor tendon, uh, FPL tendon is much more ulnar So in this case, this FPL plate has no benefit for us because we know that the, the flexor tendon will always hit to the ulnar side of the plate. And what about the zoom grade? I told you before that the zoom grade is an indicator for just um, avoiding some kind of flexor tendon problems. But the zoom rate is not um, uh, applicable for the FPL tendon plate because we know if we have a zoom grade two and we are using the FPL plate, so this gives us a false safety feeling. So we believe, okay, we are using the FPL plate, but on the other side, we have a zoom grade two. This makes no sense because uh, this will not help us avoiding uh, flexor tendon problems. And that's why. In a, even in a zoom grade two, we will have some problem and the FBL plate is not uh, the right proposition. What to do? Even if you have a fractures which are much more distally to the watershed line and you have the anatomy of the radius, which is not uh, applicable for the flex of, uh, for the FBL plate, how can you save time? How can you give the patient some time until for bone healing? That means we put the plate very distally, we put the plate maybe ulnar or radial, so the corridor for the FBL tendon is not correct. What we do in our department is we make this pronator contractus muscle flap, it's a radially based flap, so you see that you can uh, rotate the flap around one centimeter here, you can rotate the flap to the ulnar side, and that's why you can uh, uh, cover the plate and you can avoid some problems. It's not 100% safety because even in patients where we did this flap, we have some tenosynovitis. The plate is too much distally and the plate is too prominent. And But this gives you some time to achieve fracture union and then remove the plate uh, before the flexor tendon ruptures arises. So to take home about the FBL plate is uh, actually made to protect the tendon, but only if the V is placed correctly, is correctly in the corridor where the FBL tendon lies. And in soon grade two, as I told you, it has no benefit. We could uh, publish our, our, uh, our series in the Journal of Wrist Surgery uh, two years ago. The next topic is via hook plate. I will show you one case. This was a uh, done before we had the hook plate, you see a very distal fracture with a small uh, palmar lunate facet fragment. So how would you, how did we fix it at that time, especially in this CT scan on the right side? So we uh, used an uh, independent screw. You can see here one screw, of course, independent uh, standalone screws are not that uh, stable as it would have been through the plate, but we could not put the plate more distally. 
So that was the big problem to use uh, the independent schools for small fragments. Bechlana, who was a teacher of us, already showed that the lunet uh, is the key fragment. The lunet facet fragment is the key fragment in distal radius fractures because the whole carpus always follows the lunet. And he always said that there are troublesome lunet facet fragment. And uh, even in the 80s, he described that. And he always tried to buttress this fragment, which is not uh, very simple. Because if you look at the anatomy, you see that the volar rim at the lunet facet fragment is always special, is much prominent to the volar side. And that's the problem. And you can see here the 3D. The volar rim is always, the volar lunet facet fragment is always distally to the watershed line. And if you cannot fix it, if you cannot bust press it, it will always pop out. And that's uh, especially if you look at the four corner concept, you see that the whole carpus is moving to the volar side because the carpus with the lunet is following this small fragment. And why is it so difficult if you have a small fragment? You cannot put the plate very distally. You will always penetrate the joint. If you put it too proximally, then you, have, you could not fix it. And for this, the small hook plates is the best option. But if you have a larger fragment, larger fragment is the same problem. If you put it very distally, you will uh, violate the watershed line and you will have problems with the screws in the joint. It's too proximally. It's not buttressed very well you will always have some problems, especially when the patient starts moving. And for this, this uh, small, uh, extended plate is also a helpful solution. I will show you one case from our own department. Actually, it's a very simple fracture. We thought that we could fix it very nicely, but in the morning meeting, uh, experienced uh, one from us already said that what's going on here. This is the, carpal, uh, the reverse carpal view. And we recognized very early actually that uh, it was not buttressed, the, the big chunk of this fragment of the volar lunate facet fragment. Yes, the patient uh, came back after three weeks and uh, it was popped out underneath the plate. And you see what happened. It's not a simple thing now because it's very difficult to bring back the whole corpus to the dorsal side. It's almost impossible. And in these cases, we always have to do some salvage procedures. Even where we did some uh, scaphalunate, uh, radial scaphalunate arthrodesis because we could not push back this fragment. And most of the time, the fragment gets necrotic if you do too much surgery on that. So I would like to show you one case, which is actually a horrible situation. The volar lunate facet fragment is tilted about 180 degrees. Uh, the, scaff the joint surface is looking proximally, it's not there, it's not uh, facing the, the carpus. And um, we started the surgery and you see here, uh, Luke will tell you about the extended approach, FCR approach. And we could, uh, the problem was that we had the lunate facet fragment on the table already, because otherwise it was not uh, possible to do a, a nice reduction. And you see here, finally, we put the fragment back. You see, these are uh, sutures because all the, all the volar strong ligaments, the long and the short radiolunate ligaments were also gone. So we put a, the fragment back, did over, cover it with the uh, soft tissue, put some suture anchor there, and then put this hook plate, which is orientated uh, to the ulna side. And, uh, as you could see, we also had to face the, the dorsal side and it looks a very, a lot of metal is inside there. We had to fix the scaphoid too. But I can tell you this uh, patient was doing well and we all already removed the implants. So one question, just to keep you awake. What would you do in this case? If you have the x-ray, it looks very, very simple, nothing to do, but the patient had pain. And you see here a chauffeur fracture. And then we did the CT scan. And now you have a small fragment on the volar lunet uh, facet. What would you do? Would you treat it conservatively, screw fixation, tension band wiring, or a hook plate?
I will end the poll. I think the result is not such. You have the answer, Helena? Yes, everyone can see it now. So the majority uh, votes for the hook plate. Yes, of course, this is the topic of the webinar. I expected this answer, but conservatively, I would not read this. Because if you see here already, the lunet and the scaphoid are already following this fragment. And this patient have a lot of pain and have restrictions, especially in flexion. So this is also, if you don't forget this, this chunk of piece, uh, this also has a part of the radio, distal radio ulna joint. So if you, if, if you do not reduce it very well, you will also have some problem uh, in forearm rotation. And that's how we do. We make a small incision, a small L incision, and you see the whole volar rim. It's not only the lunate facet fragment, but also the radial side, the uh, scaphoid facet, the whole volar rim, the whole broadness of the radius is totally deattached. This is the small fragment here. So we always fix it like the same. We always do some future sutures here so we can pull on them, we can reduce them, we can clear everything. And then we put some preliminary uh, K-wires there, temporary K-wires, and then we put the hook plate. And we did it also atroscopically assisted because we don't want to open the joint. If you open the joint in so small fragments, that means you have cut all the strong volar ligaments and then it will uh, be a problem for instability and also necrosis. So what we do is we put, of course, you have to fix the styloid too, otherwise it will uh, end up in a problem. Luke will tell you about our, we don't like this, uh, this uh, special uh, volar ulna approach. It's a very big approach and uh, we had some, we learned our lessons. Of course, it's a nice approach. You can reach the, the, the whole, radius to the other side, but we can also come there without, uh, without using this approach. We have, I've showed you some pictures where we use the normal Henry approach. But if you, yeah, look, we tell you about that. Uh, we had the problem putting the plate is very nicely, but what about if you remove the plate? Then we had some problems with the median nerve and uh, some patients need to remove the plates that's why we don't, uh, we just uh, use the, uh, the release of the LCR, FCR tendon sheet and you can see, you can overcome, you can oversee the whole radius without uh, using any fancy ulna approaches. So take home, hook plate is used for fractures distally to the watershed line, buttress the lunate facet fragment, the FCR tendon sheet release will give you a very nice approach. And this is the rescue K-wire. You can see here, if after reducing and buttressing this fragment, the carpus is still subluxating to the volar side, what we do is just to unload. We want to unload this, uh, this fragment and we put a K-wire from the radius to the lunate. It's the same as in the Essex Lopresti fracture. If you do reconstruction of the radial head, but you want to unload, you want to save your reconstruction of the radius head, what do you do? You put two K wires through the DRU or proximal to the DRUJ just to unload this. And that's what we do. We keep it there for four weeks. And after four weeks, we remove the K wire and uh, start uh, mobilization. Thank you very much. I would give the stage to Lucas. Uh, thank you very much. Just, just to wrap up. So there are so far no questions in the chat. Seems like you explained everything just too well. Um, so I think, as you say, we can directly move over to Lucas. Can everybody hear me? Yes, and we can see your screen. Great. I would like to thank uh, Roit for the uh, for this uh, very uh, complete overview um, from the start uh, up till uh, 
now. So every time you introduce a new technique, you will find uh, complications. And um, um, I'm, I see this is the start of the presentation. So anytime you start a new technique, you will find out complications. And uh, we should not be ashamed of that, but, but, uh, but solve it. Um, the volar plate fixation is considered at this moment the gold standard for distal radius fracture treatment. And the reason is that you see less hardware irritation than with the dorsal approach. Um, and you also see less implant related tendon ruptures. Mainly the extensor tendons are at risk with a volar plate um, because of the prominent screws on the dorsal side. Uh, and the flexor tendons, it's, uh, if there is a rupture, it's, uh, the FPL is 10 times more prone to a rupture than the other flexor tendons, um, as illustrated by the, uh, the, uh, the research from Rowett. So once again, this is a transverse cut. Here you see the FPL seems not to lie against the bone, but it's, a, it's not a dynamic view. So the FPL moves to the ulnar side and um, uh, to the cortex of the radius. And it's illustrated here. The FPL beschermt, waardoor je de plaat nog al distal kan zetten. So this is an FPL plate. Yeah, see. And the FPL here does not seem to be uh, in contact with the, uh, with the, the plate doesn't seem to have contact with the, with the tendon. So now first something about the biomechanics, then uh, an alternative for the ulnar-based uh, surgical approach. It's called the extended FCR approach from Jorge Orbe. And then I will present a couple of cases. Um, and I would like to share thoughts with you about it. So the cases are combined with poll questions. This is work from Greg Bain in Australia. Um, transfer cut of the distal radius. The gray blocks, they represent the insertion area of the stabilizing radiocarpal ligaments. And the, um, uh, the blue circles, they indicate where most recently the, the, the fractures occur. So as you can see, the ligament insertions, they are spared from fracture lines because the ligaments, they reinforce the bone locally. So the, 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 the breaks in the bone seem to occur uh, in between the uh, insertion of the radiocarpal ligaments. And as you can see, if you connect these two areas, you will have a volar facet fracture. This is a, uh, um, a picture showing where the contact forces of the lunate and the scaphoid occur in the lunate and scaphoid fossa. So Top is dorsal, bottom is volar. And as you can see, the contact pressure of the lunate concentrates on the volar side. That's also a reason why the volar facet is prone to fracture. Then the first poll question uh, for my presentation is the volar Barton fracture, uh, which is the name for the uh, volar facet fracture. Is the volar Barton fracture caused by tangential stress and uh, compressional stress or shear stress? Um, Helena? Yes, the question is already... <laughs> Sorry? I see there the poll is uh, based on the soon grade. So shall we say... Um, just the people, they, they choose one, two, or three. So one is tangential stress, two is uh, compressional stress, and three is shear stress. Yeah, maybe we, um, I, I cannot add this right now. We will just maybe skip this, and maybe you can um, okay. go right okay. into the solution. So as you can see, it's uh, shear stress. So what is the difference? Tangential stress pulls things apart. Compressional uh, stress uh, pushes things together. And with uh, shear stress, there is a translation uh, in between the, the, uh, the material layers. So the, the lunate shears off, pushes off the volar facet 
from the rest of the radius. Good, to, uh, to elucidate why we got a shear stress fracture, we have to look at the microstructure from the distal radius. The distal radius is light and strong, and uh, that's being achieved with a sandwich construction, with a honeycomb sandwich construction. This construction is used also in the building of uh, airplanes. So what you have is a strong top sheet and a strong bottom sheet, and in between there is a light honeycomb structure that uh, keeps the, the top and the bottom layer apart. You can make the layers of different materials from carbon fire, fiber or from uh, aluminum. But again, the top and bottom layer, they are from very strong material. And the uh, layer in between the honeycomb, it's not so strong. It just prevents bending from the top and the bottom layer. Looking at the distal radius, here you see uh, the columns. They represent the, uh, well, the, the, the top sheet and the bottom sheet from the honeycomb sandwich. So these columns they are very thin and strong, and they are even preserved in osteoporotic bone. In between the, uh, the columns, you have uh, supportive struts. They, are the, uh, they can be compared with the honeycomb. Well, and um, they are weaker. So the force travels through the weaker struts and you get a, uh, you get a volar, uh, your volar uh, facade fracture. Now something about the surgical approach. So this is a, a saw bone. This is the area that we want to reach uh, for the volar facet. This would be an indication from the hoop for a hook plate. So a fractured distal from the watershed line. And here you have a larger piece that could be buttressed by a, a more standard plate. So this is the link for Vimedi. For the people who don't know Vimedi, uh, it's a platform for sharing uh, thoughts and especially surgical uh, uh, information videos. Uh, I find it very useful also for my daily practice and people who don't uh, know it, I would recommend them to have a look at it and then sign up. It's, it's free, it's, uh, you don't pay anything. So this is the link in Vimedi, and here is the, the video. It's from Jorge Orbe, showing the extended FCR approach as an alternative for the ulnar-based approach. The video takes about a minute. So the incision runs distally to the flexor crease of the wrist. And as Roy pointed out, you have to release the FCR flexor tendon sheath distally. You release both the bottom from the FCR flexor tendon sheath, uh, the top as well as the bottom. And there is a very thick bottom. So if you don't uh, release this, it's really difficult to pull, uh, to pull the tendons to the ulnar site. So I skip the rest of the approach. You can uh, watch it on Vimedi. This is uh, the last part. Uh, sorry, I have to go there. Yeah, here we go. So with this approach, you can uh, take the distal, you can take the radius out and you can uh, even reach the distal, the periosteum, which can be helpful in uh, and a good reduction from the dorsal parts and prevent the V-shape reduction. The exposure gives you uh, the possibility to have uh, good flaps from the pronator quadratus and, uh, and uh, fold it back over the plate. So it looks quite extensive, but I don't see any difference with a uh, less extensive approach with respect to speed of rehabilitation. And if you have a difficult fracture, please uh, uh, don't, don't be afraid to do a little bit more uh, than your standard approach and have a look at the XM FCR approach. There's another uh, discussion about if the volar facet fracture also can, can, occur, can occur dorsally, never say never, but usually it's on the volar side 
of the radius. This is discussed by, uh, by Jesse Jupiter also on Vimedi. You can have a look at that video. So this is the first case. Um, a lady who had the, um, uh, well, the fracture dislocation of the DRUG and there is a combination of the distal radius. And when you look really well on, this, uh, on the initial x-rays, you see a small, um, you see a small uh, break in, at the volar facet. These are the paraoperative pictures. Uh, we choose a normal FPL plate. Um, and here on the postoperative CT scan, you can see that the plate just ca captures the volar facet. In a case like this, you could, uh, um, well, you could put in the escape with the, with the cape wire from dorsally to uh, stabilize the lunate and to uh, protect the volar facet fragment if you did not use a hook plate. These are the lines from the, from the soon grade. So the FPL plate uh, reaches the volar facet quite distally without crossing um, uh, the soon two line. So the second case, it's a poll. It's a 559 year old woman who has a desk job, right hand dominant. She fell on an outstretched left hand. These are the pictures about six months after the operation. And she still has pain both dorsally as well as, as on the volar side. So this plate was put in. And would you classify the position of this plate? Soon one, zero, one, or two? So we have close to 50% answered the question. I will close it and the majority votes for Zoom grade two. Okay, with any classification there is, uh, well, it's difficult to design a classification where everyone thinks the same about the situation, but uh, I, I'm glad we all agree that the position of this plate is not perfectly uh, placed with respect to the flexor tendon. Actually, the uh, reduction uh, from the fracture was, uh, was really well. And after the material was taken out, the patient had an uneventful, uh, uneventful uh, recovery. So the same patient uh, is shown in the next uh, small video where you can see what, the, uh, what you see on the inside when you... With respect to it, too. this is video from the same patient. Yeah, over the plot on the here. The plot so we still do not see fraying of the FPL, but there's clearly tenosynovitis and the plate sticks out. So it was good to take it out before we got in trouble. So the next case, it's a 60 year old woman and she fell on both wrists due to a seizure. She was an in, uh, inpatient at the rehabilitation unit. And um, after the, after the cerebral, cerebral vascular accident, she had a left hand uh, of left arm paresthesis. So she fell on both wrists, having about a symmetric fracture pattern. And this case illustrates what we want to prevent. So how would you treat this case? Put it in a cast, screw fixation plate, fixation additional imaging.
this is a very unclear result. I will share it. Let's say 50% of us would go straight into theater and the other 50% would opt for additional imaging. So what would you say? Uh, learning from mistakes, I, I have a very low threshold to do a preoperative CT scan if you see an intraarticular fracture. So then you know better what you start, uh, well, you have a better plan in your mind before you start with the surgery. You can measure screw length and have, a, uh, have an idea about uh, what you're going to do, choose the implant. Sometimes you have a, a surprise and uh, the volar facet, you think you buttress it and then in the end you find out it's still not buttressed. So I think you're better prepared with an intraarticular fracture when you make a CT scan with a low threshold. So I would say this is not the right option. I would so I would go for additional imaging and then do the operation. So my colleague um, uh, did not do additional imaging. There was an operation and these are the post-operative results. I would say this is the worst uh, case scenario. And um, of course we proceed to another surgery. So going to the next surgery, which implant uh, would you choose? I think none of us would uh, treat the patient unoperatively. We would do the plate fixation with another plate who would use a hook plate or who would go for additional imaging. Again, this is uh, kind of 50-50. So no one would, op no one would uh, treat con conservatively. I'm glad with that. And uh, in the hospital, it was chosen to uh, use a normal plate because at that time we did not have the hook plate available. And this case uh, clearly, clearly represents why I'm really happy we do have the hook plate available right now, because um, as you can see, well, on the right side, things seem, seem to be okay. On the left side, you already see a difference. So there's a smaller uh, distance between the corpus and the ulna, suggesting that the lunate might have uh, Subluxed again. So the lunid is a little bit more to the volar side on the left side. And you see that the, uh, the volar facet uh, kind of wants to escape again. So this, this is already visible on the images during the operation. And these are the results. So again, there is a subluxation of the lunate on the left wrist, and uh, we decided to leave it like this. She was not very symptomatic. Um, it was our uh, paralyzed arm, and uh, she was treated with a with a wrist supportive wrist cast. So I think right option would have been hook plate fixation. And uh, another case, a young man, manual worker, high demand. He fell uh, with his bike and we have this X-ray. So on these images, which are the standard images, you don't see anything. Looking at these images, what would you do?
Great. Thank you. So when you make a bleak view, there's certainly a problem visualized. Looking at this, I would say it's an intraarticular fracture and we do additional imaging. So these are the images from the wrist. You don't only see a uh, lunate facet fracture with a very small fragment, but you also see impaction of the, of the joint uh, surface, which I think you, uh, you might have uh, forgotten or, or uh, you might not have been aware of that if you had not done additional imaging. So my advice would be always perform a CT scan with an, an intraarticular fracture before you start the operation. So what would you do? There's a stylet fracture and the volar facet. Just a few more seconds. And here we go. Oh, it. Um, what would you have done? What did you choose for the poll? You mean like me? No. So oh, it there, yeah. Yeah, boy. Good. What would you have? Yeah, for this uh, kind of fracture, our standard is this hook plate, but not the small one. The problem with the small one, with the independent uh, hooks, uh, you always end up in the fracture line for the screws. So I would use a, a plate with the hook. But here you have to reduce this, this fragment. This is most important fragment in the intermediate. Yeah, thank you. So um, our, our approach for uh, the decision-making for the ulnar styloid is uh, first fix the radius and afterwards have a look if the uh, distal radio ulnar joint is stable or not. Um, so I, I'm used before I go into the surgery to first uh, have have a feeling with the other wrist for comparison for comparison, and then I fix the radius and I test test if the DRUJ is uh, less stable than on the other side. And only then, if I find out it's it's different than the other side, I would suggest uh, fixing the ulnar styloid. So in this case, we fixed the radius and the distal radio ulnar joint was stable and we did not need anything else there. We still only had the, um, the small um, hook plates there, not, so not the plate you showed in your presentation, which has the hooks attached. And uh, this is how the pictures look uh, uh, post-operatively. So you have the, the, the single little hook plate and you have a double one, uh, a larger one. We use the larger one. And I think uh, the reduction was all right. The small uh, plate is being uh, stabilized by the distal end of the, of the FPL plate. And I think this is an important view for the people who, who want to use this small extra plate. As you can see, the, uh, there's a risk of the screw tip entering the distal, the most ulnar screw tip of the hook plate of entering the distal radio ulnar joint. And with respect to the um, uh, tilt of the scaphoid faucet and, and the lunate faucet, the, the lunate uh, fossa, uh, ha, the volar tilt of the lunate fossa is usually a bit less than of the scaphoid fossa. And as a result, when you put in the screws from the little hook plate and you put them perpendicular to the hook plate, you will end up with the tip of the screw and the radiocarpal joint touching the lunate. 
So aim your screws a little bit back. So when you put the screw in perpendicular to the little hook plate, uh, you end up with a right line. And then you don't want to be there. So aim a little bit back. And that's actually quite a strange angle if you didn't do that before. Uh, whenever you have a uh, cadaver course and you get the, the, the chance to practice it, I would uh, recommend putting in a hook plate. So next case, 59 year old cleaning lady, bicycle fall. What would you do? Non-operative in a wrist cast, screw fixation, plate fixation, or a digital imaging. Can everybody see the results? Yes, that looks very clear. Yes, thanks. So, yeah, there's a couple of things that uh, warn you here with a normal X-ray. The ulna is uh, sticking out against the corpus and you don't see a, a clear uh, um, uh, well, uh, the, the joint line has disappeared uh, between the scaphoid and the distal radius. That looks really a bit strange there. So whenever I, whenever I don't see clear joint lines, I am suspicious. This is the CT scan. And there's a little bit more there than just the uh, vola facet fracture from the lunate. As you can see, there's uh, quite some damage uh, with the scaphoid as well, with impression of the articular surface. And you will really not uh, have an idea about the, the severity of the injury when, when you just only have these, these, uh, these simple x-rays. Large volar fragment with a diapunch fracture and the scaphoid fracture. As uh, Rohit pointed out, the corpus follows the lunate and the scaphoid follows the lunate. So, a poll. Sorry. <laughs> you spoiled it. Oh, yes, I spoiled it. I, uh, <laughs> I'm becoming impatient. I'm sorry for that. Or maybe someone has a different opinion still. <laughs> yes, so please, uh, all of you finish the poll. I'm just curious what people would do. Looks like the majority is uh, with you. Yes. Just a few seconds. There you go. Good, thank you for that. With this, uh, this fracture now, well, uh, so what's the thought behind it? This is a large fragment. So it's uh, proximal to the watershed line. And uh, I think that can be buttressed with a, use using a normal plate. There is no danger of a, a small tip fragment escaping. Your, your standard plate. So this is what, uh, what it looks like. When I keep in mind what Roy told about the position of the plate, you see this is quite a narrow distal radius. And for the FPL, it's positioned a little bit too far to the radial side. So I learned something from, uh, from, my, from my colleague there the previous uh, 30 minutes. And I think I, I, I'm gonna really, I will take that really into account when I put in the plate next time that I, I will put it as uh, ulnarly as possible when the radius is wide enough. So the reduction was all right. 
and after the after the uh, lunate facade, the scaphoid was um, fixed additionally with a dorsal approach, and uh, there was elongation of the scaphoid lunate uh, ligament dorsally, so an anchor was used to, for augmentation. These are the pictures posed operatively. And uh, while well, she had an uneventful uh, recovery, she is a cleaning lady, which is a high demand profession. And she works in my hospital, so I, I was mo motivated to get it well. <laughs> the the scaphoid screw was taken out. Uh, I think it stuck out by about uh, 0 0.5 millimeter distally, but um, she didn't have um, any problem there. Uh, but I just took it out to be sure uh, she was all right in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from uh, from the audience? Um, surprisingly, we don't have. Presentations were just too well prepared. Maybe there's a question, Rohit, from your side. Are we at, now we have a question in the chat um, uh, to Rohit. Is the small L-shaped approach no problem uh, with the radialis palmaris? No, no, we don't um, see any problems with that. Because we, we stay proximal to the receptor and uh, this makes no problem. Look, I saw uh, very frequently you use the K wire from the uh, radius to the lunate. Is that a standard for you or do you check the subluxation? I, um, I well, uh, once we, we get the hook plate with the, with the fixed um, uh, hooks that are one piece together with the plate, uh, I, will, I would be less, um, uh, well, my threshold would, would, would be quite much higher to put in a K wire because you don't want to violate the radiocarpal joint. And the cases I showed you, uh, the patient was a garbage man. I don't think he's a very compliant type of patient. And that was my reason to put in a, an escape with the K uh, wire. Um, and um, well, the, the other one that uh, uh, I think that was the case with the lady uh, where you, you had, I think, an inefficient uh, buttress with the, with the standard plate. So I put in the K wire as an escape, but I certainly would uh, prefer to not put in the K wire only when I doubt about the patient's uh, compliance or when I think the fixation is not optimal, I put in a K wire. Okay. Uh, I have a question for you, Ruit. Um, I think you use that uh, uh, radially based pronator flap also to cover the uh, hook plate. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. And um, do you ever? Uh, well, what is your opinion when you use the flap? Should you stay? Should you take out all hook plates uh, in the end, or um, what is your approach to that? Or do you think uh, the flap will protect the patient enough? No, this is actually if you use the hook plate, you don't have to do this, because nowadays we don't use the flap in the hook plate. It's not necessary. In the starting, we use that because whenever we put the plate distal to the watershed line, it was so standardized for us. Whenever you put the plate distally, we make the pronator quadratus radially based. Yeah. But uh, from the experience now, it's not necessary anymore for the hook plates. And we also do not remove them routinely. So we what you say is, no is that uh, is that the hook plate uh, it's uh, it's low profile and uh, because it's on the Erlnoff site, it's not uh, in contact with the FPL. Exactly. Yes. Okay. That that's uh, that's good news. Um, there is a question in the chat. Uh, maybe to both of you, if you don't have available the FPL or hook plate, uh, do you have any alternatives that you recommend? Or what is your implant strategy? 
Yeah, what we do, well, what we did in former times, if we had not the plate, we used the, the mini fragment plates from the from the metacarpal, and we just uh, cut them in in between the holes and used them like a hook, as we did in the in the lateral malleolus with a one third tubular plate. Yes, and we we had a so, couple of cases of them which went very well, but you know. Yeah, of course you have to cut them, you have to bend them. And this is a, this was our approach. So um, you have a, uh, experience with another technique, it's the tangent bent uh, wiring. And uh, what would you recommend uh, uh, our colleagues to do with that? Would you advise uh, also tangent bent wiring or what, what's your idea about that? In our hands, tension band wiring was a horrible situation. <laughs> we, we used them, but we had no good good results. So we, we, we just stopped doing this. Okay. I never tried it, so. Yeah. Some other questions? Mm, I have a question here. Um... To Lucas, um, if the FPL plate would be your first choice uh, in general for radius fractures, probably it depends very much on the fracture type, I guess. Um, I started using the FPL plate. We have it as a standard plate. Uh, so uh, whatever you use most, I think you, you are best at, uh, at using it. Uh, so that is our standard plate uh, in, in general. It's quite low profile at the lunar, at the lunate facade. It goes quite distally, supporting that important lunate facade. Um, and well, probably uh, if you position it enough to the ulnar side, you might prevent some hardware irritation, uh, even with a more distal position compared to a standard uh, plate, because uh, the FPL is. Uh, well, it's not always saved by the FPL plate, so you have to put in the plate on the ulnar side. But 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 I think if you have this plate available, it, uh, uh, I would prefer it over a standard plate. Yeah, this is our our experience too, because actually we don't think about this uh, notch for the FPL tendon, but as you said, using the FPL plate with the ulnar column, you can get much more distally without uh, problems. And this is the, the why we use it very nice, very often, because if you can buttress the lunate facet and uh, with no other plate, you can get much uh, more distally like this. So this is the second advantage of that. I'm using the plate now for, for uh, about two years. Um, before we had, of course, uh, other plates in our hospital. And uh, the rate of hardware, hardware material removal has, has decreased uh, uh, a lot since we, since we started using uh, the FPL plate. Okay. All right. I cannot see more questions in the chat for the moment, but we are uh, a little bit over time uh, anyway. So uh, I would like to thank you very much, Lucas and Rohit, for your presentations and the valued input. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed it. The recordings will be available on our YouTube channel, channel as I said before. And I wish everyone a very pleasant evening and watch out for upcoming events uh, on the Medardis uh, webinar Wednesday. The next one will take place on March 24th about different aspects of the dorsal plating.